At Fermilab, we study nature at its most fundamental, drilling down to the smallest scales of matter using some of the largest and most advanced machines in the world. Accelerators, powerful microscopes, send particles barreling at near light speed into other matter, creating subatomic scraps. Detectors zoom in on those fleeting pieces, making the invisible perceptible. And sophisticated computers sweep through all of it, crushing mountains of information into gems of data. We also use our cutting edge technology to explore the mysteries of dark matter and the quantum realm. Thousands of scientists from around the world partner with Fermilab to explore how the universe works, expanding humanity's understanding of matter, energy, space, and time. Fermilab is solving the mysteries of the universe. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening for the benefits of particle physics, contributions to the medical field. Um, we have a great program lined up for you. I'm really excited about the panelists that we've brought together. They're gonna to talk to you a little bit about their work. So we have uh, with us this evening, uh, we have Dr. Jennifer Raff, who is a senior scientist and head of the Dune department in the neutrino division at Fermilab. Her research focuses on neutrino physics and on the searches for rare decays that can be observed in the very large, I'm sorry, that can be observed in the very large size detectors that are required by neutrino experiments. She specializes also in detector instrumentation with current focus on liquid and gaseous argon time projection chambers. Dr. Tanaz Mohayai is a postdoctoral research associate at Fermilab. As a member of the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment and the currently running Neutrino Experiment Microboon, she researches neutrinos using liquid and gaseous argon time projection chambers. As a PhD student at, at Illinois Institute of Technology, she also carried her research at Fermilab while participating in the Department of Energy Office of Science Graduate Student Research Program. She finished her PhD in accelerator physics with a focus on an unconventional way of producing neutrino beams. And we also have with us Dr. Jim Welsh. He's a chief of radiation oncology at the Edward Hines VA Medical Center and professor and director of translational research at Loyola University Stritch School of Medicine. He is a past president of the American College of Radiation Oncology and editor in chief of the Journal of Radiation Oncology. He has spoken at Fermilab in the past for the Ask a Scientist program in the colloquium. He is currently involved in research on how the use of low-dose radiation to treat cy the cytokine storm associated with COVID-19 pneumonia. He is also the author of Sharks Get Cancer, Mole Rats Don't, How Animals Might Hold the Key to Cancer Immunity. For this talk, please use the Q&A button to submit questions at the bottom of your screen. We'll take questions at, uh, for all the panelists at the end of their talks. And with that, I will turn the Zoom over to Dr. Welsh. Oh, hello. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, can you hear me? Can everybody uh, uh, Yep, I can hear hear you. Me see me? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, in that case, I'll try to uh, get the show started by sharing my screen and starting the presentation. Are we good to go? Looks great. All right. So today I'll talk to you about some applications of particle physics in medicine. And I know this question comes up quite regularly about, are there any practical applications of esoteric topics in physics, such as general and special relativity, quantum mechanics, and particle physics? Well, we don't have to go too far to understand that the answer is clearly yes. Here's the famous Einstein field equation, not the uh, familiar E equals MC squared relation, but uh, a more complicated tensor equation that relates the curvature of space-time to the density of energy and matter in that space-time. While it might seem like there are very few applications of this in the real world, you don't have to go too far to see that uh, on a daily basis, we use the 
general relativity theory in our GPS systems. In order for GPS to properly take into account our exact location and um, our destination, we have to remember that these satellites are moving at 14,000 kilometers per hour, which while quite fast is not relativistically fast, but special relativity does have to be taken into account because time does slow down for fast moving travelers. More importantly, however, these satellites are far from the core of the earth and clocks tick a bit faster when they're in a vicinity of less gravitationally induced space-time warp. So all of this has to be taken into account and is done so on a regular basis when we try to get from this destination to the next using our GPS. But speaking of the Einstein equation, here is the simpler but equally elegant elegant uh, equation equals mc squared that relates matter to energy. And we know that when matter meets antimatter, pure energy is released. We know what's going to go, what's going to happen here, kaboom. But let's not focus on death, doom, and destruction today. Let's talk about something fun, such as the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway. So instead of using glucose, in this particular pathway, and cancer cells incidentally love to use this pathway. How about instead of glucose, we use a glucose analog called FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose. It is tagged with F18, fluorine 18, which is a positron emitter. The point here is that FDG enters cancer cells but never leaves, and they emit positrons. When they emit positrons, being the antimatter equivalent of the electron, the positrons are going to encounter electrons and release gamma rays. The gamma rays can be imaged with a gamma camera, and that is the basis for PET scanning, PET being positron emission tomography. So here we can see within this patient's body the areas of concern. Using PET, we can see things that we might not be able to see otherwise. For example, on the left, we have this CAT scan and it's hard to see the cancer. However, when it's combined with a PET scan, the cancer brightly lights up in yellow and we can visualize it clearly. Similarly, we have this patient with this possible lung tumor in the left lung. Is it? Well, it sure looks like it based on the PET scan. And here's another one. Uh, tumor in the left upper lobe visualized on PET scan. If we can see it, we can possibly cure it. Speaking of seeing things, there is nothing more accurate and exquisite for imaging the human body than magnetic resonance imaging. Incidentally, MRI and particle physics both benefited from the development of superconducting magnet technology. How does it work? Well, protons, say in water molecules, which are nothing more than H2O um, and composed of two hydrogen nuclei and therefore have abundant protons, are randomly oriented in the absence of magnetic field, but become aligned with that magnetic field when one is applied. And in so doing, these protons become aligned and recess around uh, the axis of the uh, magnetic field. Precession simply means this movement like a gyroscope. In any case, when these nuclei are hit with an pulse of energy, they flip. And one can flip them in a variety of different ways, and manipulate them according to how we want to. And the important point here is that when these flipped out nuclei relax, they then emit a signal. And this signal can be interpreted to give us the internal anatomy of a human body because different materials give different signals. So you can see the human heart as it beats within this thorax. You can see elaborate neuroanatomy within this uh, this uh, human um, 
individual brain in a sagittal section. But while these images are great for gross anatomy, the latest and greatest application is something called diffusion tensor imaging or DTI MRI. Here we can see various connections, the white matter tracks that connect things like the cerebral cortex to the medulla oblongata or to the thalamus and the nucleus accumbens or, or to the uh, um, corpus striatum. This is all part of the Human Brain Connectome Project and DTI imaging is an integral component of it. Getting back to matter versus antimatter, well, let's have a little showdown here between the proton with his two up quarks and a down quark versus his nemesis, the antiproton. Well, incidentally, antiprotons can be found in the Van Allen belts. Anyway, here in the, the medical clinic, we know what could happen when protons meet antiprotons. There's going to be some action, but let's see if we can put that to good use like the uh, Starship Enterprise has put to good use when it moves to warp drive. And of course, uh, um, the antimatter drive in uh, the Starship Enterprise was controlled by dilithium crystals, which I didn't realize you can just purchase online now. This is great. So while the antiprotons are the stuff of legends in the sci-fi world, one has to ask, does he really have what it takes to fight cancer in the real world? Well, some of us think that maybe antiprotons could get the job done. And there are some who are applying antiprotons to anti-cancer therapy. It turns out that antiprotons might have just a little bit too much punch for uh, the practical world because they release an awful lot of energy and that energy may or may not stay put. But some people have predicted that Antiprotons could be the very best particle for radiation therapy. All right, what's this? Well, this is a pion star. No, it's not the kind of star that you might see uh, in these pillars of creation, but it's the kind of star that is created when a negative pion, pi meson, is captured by an atom when we use pion beam radiation therapy. Pion beams might be useful for radiation therapy of cancers. And one of the interesting things that happens when a pion is finally captured by the atom, an atom, it, if negatively charged, a negative pion that is, is captured by an atom, it orbits the atom as though it were an electron, but it can't stay in these orbitals forever. It spirals downward and eventually crashes into the nucleus, and that produces a pion star. The pion star is when the nucleus cracks up into uh, a bunch of neutrons, protons, alpha particles, and nuclear fragments. All right, the next topic is uh, illustrated by these wonderful photos here of the pyramids that we all are familiar with. But do we know what's really inside? Well, you can't just knock down these walls left and right because you suspect there's something interesting behind wall number two. But you might be able to use proton, oh, I'm sorry, muon radiography to examine what's inside the pyramids. Where do the muons come from? They are produced by cosmic ray interactions in the upper atmosphere with nitrogen, oxygen, other molecules and atoms that then produce new muons, which have very, very short half-lives measured in microseconds. But because they're traveling at relativistic speed, speed slows, time slows down. They live longer and they reach the surface of the earth. They reach the pyramids and they penetrate through the pyramids and allow us to image what's inside. Well, muons might actually present an attractive form of external beam radiation therapy. And curiously, the technology used in muon radiography is not too dissimilar to a technique that I and my team are using for proton imaging and proton radiography. Well, muons are leptons. Speaking of leptons, the most popular 
lepton in radiation therapy is electron beam treatment or beta particle radioisotope therapy. These are leptons with uh, a spin of one half. And a classic example is given when a proton decays, a neutron decays into a proton and releases a beta particle. In this example of strontium-90 decaying into uh, yttrium-90, it releases a beta particle that can be used for treatment of this condition, the pterygium. Pterygium um, treatments do work and they get rid of this once and for all. Um, the most common form of radiation therapy, however, is in the form of bosons, specifically bosons of spin one, gauge bosons called photons. And these are produced by electron beam linear accelerators that smack an electron beam into a, a tungsten target and produce bremsstrahlung. The linear accelerator is mounted on a gantry that can rotate around the patient and the photon beam goes through the multi-leaf collimator which shapes the photon beam in an exotic uh, distribution of radiation in a very rapid fashion. Also, you can have robotic radio surgery that moves around the patient and provides radiation dynamically in a targeted fashion and addresses motion within a patient. What could be better than all this? Well, it's possible that Dr. Wilson himself came up with the best solution and that might be, uh, and here's uh, Robert Wilson at the groundbreaking ceremony, and here he is picking up his national medal. But uh, it was back in 1946 that he suggested that protons could be useful for radiation therapy. Protons are hadrons, they're fermions of spin one half, and the important point is that protons stop. Here's a cyclotron that uh, is used for proton beam therapy. Here's a gantry that is used for proton beam therapy. These things are not small by anybody's definition, but when they're covered up and they have their, um, their, uh, their makeup on, they look quite good and are quite beautiful, in my opinion, uh, quite attractive. Some of my friends are a little bit nervous about these things because they feel like this machine is smarter than they are and it's it's watching them, it knows what they're thinking, but these guys just maybe watch too many sci-fi movies, such as 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, here's the HAL computer that uh, um, some people think reminds them of proton therapy. I do not. But how do we improve proton beam therapy? Maybe through proton radiography, which allows me to better determine where the beam is truly going to stop within the patient. Here are some of the images we've obtained from our proton radiography system. Proton radiography can be adapted for proton CT. And before I, I finish, I want to talk about this guy, the neutron, which was used for many years here at Fermilab. Neutron therapy facility was quite active and quite uh, successful. Interestingly, neutrons don't last forever, they decay. How long do they live before decaying? Well, some people using bottle methods have come up with a half-life that differs from other people who are using beam methods. So it leads to a question of whether there's another mode of decay out there. Some people have even speculated that neutrons could decay into dark matter. What I do know is that when neutrons interact with tumors, and the matter within the tumors, they change one element into another. This is genuine alchemy. And that means neutrons are very biologically powerful and capable of killing even huge tumors of this uh, magnitude. Another application of neutrons might be BNCT, boron neutron capture therapy. In this case, a patient has a, a brain tumor and that brain tumor is exposed to a beam of neutrons. The tumor cells have boron 10 in them whereas the normal cells do not. Boron 10 undergoes fission into highly energetic uh, fragments, including alpha particles, and may be a very successful form of cancer treatment. Here's Fred Hawthorne picking up his national medal. 
Is there anything better than BNCT? Well, uranium undergoes fission and releases even more energy than boron. It might not be practical because I'm having a hard time getting a hold of any uranium for experiments, but that's all right because what might be even better is carbon. Carbon ion beam radiation therapy might be the perfect blend of biological potency that you see with neutrons and the elegant dose distributions that you get with protons. So maybe carbon ions are the Goldilocks radiation. It could be king. I've been talking about radiation therapy and particle therapy for cardiac, uh, for cancer, but it might be useful for cardiac disease. And this is a new horizon and a possible application that we'll see in the near future. But uh, that's for another day. I'll stop here and uh, look forward to um, any questions the audience might have. Thank you so much. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, move on to our next presentation. And um, at people, if, um, our audience members, if you have uh, questions, you can put them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And then um, you can type those in. And we will uh, move on to our next presentation from Dr. Ruff and Dr. Uh, Mohaye. OK, thanks, Amanda. So Tanaz and I are going to tell you about a project that we were fortunate to be involved with, which is the Mechanical Ventilator Milano, or MVM. I'm going to tell you about the design of the device, and then Tanaz will tell you about its functionality. Before we get into the design, I wanted to quickly go over some of the basics of normal ventilation. So to th start, we can just think of our chests as a closed box. There's only one path for the air to go into and out of your lungs, and it can be closed off if you hold your breath. Uh, so when we're breathing, the diaphragm is moving to either increase the available volume for your lungs to fill or to decrease that volume. So if you have a closed system like your chest or like these containers in the center picture on the slide, then the volume and the pressure are inversely related, meaning when the volume increases, that means the pressure will go down and vice versa. Now, our respiratory systems are not actually a completely closed system because we can add air in or release air out of our lungs through our noses and mouths. But what we know from the laws of physics is that if you connect two systems that have different pressures, the gas or air in this case, is gonna flow from the higher pressure side to the lower pressure side. So when your diaphragm expands the volume, it causes the pressure inside your lungs to be lower than the pressure of the air, the, uh, air in the room, and then your body will inhale to equalize those two pressures. Once you've filled your lungs, then the diaphragm pushes up to contract the volume, and that causes the pressure inside your lungs to increase, and that means it has a greater pressure than the ambient pressure in the room, and your body will exhale to equalize the pressure again. So that's how it works if you're breathing naturally on your own, uh, but sometimes your body can't do the breathing correctly. So in that case, uh, sometimes a mechanical ventilator is necessary. And what it's doing is creating a pressure differential to make air move into and out of your lungs. So that's the main function of the ventilator that we've designed to create these pressure differences uh, to make the patients inhale or exhale. The we that I'm talking about is the team of people who volunteered their time to develop the mechanical ventilator Milano. And it's a pretty big team. The blue markers here are showing you where we were around the world. And it was more than 100 people uh, with a collaboration between research institutions like Fermilab and other national laboratories, as well as uh, university groups, medical experts like doctors and respiratory therapists and also private sector companies like manufacturers. We wanted the device to be as accessible as possible. And so when we started, we decided uh, to stick to four simple design principles. The first was that it should be low cost. So commercially available ventilators can cost as much as $50,000 and they're typically somewhere around $35,000. There's a reason that those machines are so expensive. They have a lot of bells and whistles um, that we didn't intend to implement in our more simple machine because we were specifically targeting treatment of COVID-19 patients. So we focused only on the functionality that was needed for those patients. Another thing that affects the cost is parts. 
So we were able to use almost all off the shelf commercially available parts. And that's another thing that keeps the cost lower. So in the end, uh, the parts cost for our machine is somewhere around $5,000 and the total cost, including manufacturing and technical support ends up being around 10,000. So it's anywhere from three to five times cheaper than other commercially available ventilators. We also obviously wanted the machine to be robust and reliable. And so from a hardware standpoint, what that means is the fewer individual parts you use, the less chance you have that a part will break. So when you're designing something, it implies that you should use as few parts as possible. We also wanted to design something that was easy to manufacture. Uh, in large quantities and in a short amount of time for obvious reasons. And finally, we wanted the overall design concept to remain open access so that others could design similar devices without having to fully reinvent the wheel. So here's the design. The components that make up the MVM design are inside this light blue box outlined there. And it just needs elect an electrical outlet and a source of pressurized medical air and oxygen. And that's something that's available in most emergency rooms and intensive care units. But if that doesn't, uh, isn't available, then in the absence of a wall hookup like that, you can uh, use a portable tank of pressurized air or oxygen. So starting at the top left of the image, you see where the air and oxygen enter this thing called GB1. That is an off the shelf gas blender that allows you to adjust the fraction of oxygen that the patient breathes. So the normal air that we're breathing right now is only 21% oxygen, but sometimes it's useful for patients with respiratory problems to breathe air that has a higher fraction of ox oxygen. And so that's what this blender allows. This valve that I've circled next uh, controls the pressure that's provided to the patient. It's electrically controlled and it adjusts its, uh, the, how much the valve is open as part of a process control loop that's based on uh, pressures that we measure elsewhere in the system. The valve circled in yellow at the top is a three-way valve that drives this other valve down at the bottom. And so what it's doing is deciding to open or close the valve at the bottom at the appropriate time in the breathing cycle to allow the patient to exhale. There are also several pressure sensors that are shown. I've circled a couple of them there. And those measure, measure the pressure at various points in the system. You'll notice they're inside this light pink box and that's the brains of the device. So it's a microcomputer that's supervising the operations and deciding when to open and close the various valves based on what measurements it sees from the sensors. We also measure airflow. Uh, and that is done with a combination of flow sensors and also uh, pressure differentials from which you can calculate a flow. And then finally, this valve at the end that's labeled as PEEP valve is a mechanical relief valve uh, that's at the end of the expiratory line. And that sets the minimum pressure that's left in the lungs after exhaling. And Tanaz will talk a little bit more about that. So all of this equipment at the bottom is external to the ventilator. Everything I've circled in purple there. Uh, it's part of the breathing circuit that's shown at the right. And that's where the patient is attached to the machine at the top here. And then all these other little tubes are attached into the ventilator uh, to measure the pressures and provide the airflow. So let me show you uh, the progression of the design. The project really started in um, mid-March of 2020. And by the last week of that month, we already had a, a, an early prototype built and here it is. So what you're looking at right now, that's actually a fake lung to let us test the functionality of the device. The tubing is what's providing the air direction and flow. And those columns of water are just a way of regulating the pressure. That, those are definitely not intended to be in the final design, uh, but this was just a proof of concept to see that we could make our microcomputer do the correct sequencing of inhalation and exhalation on the right time scale. In our second prototype here, we had eliminated the temporary water column method of setting pressures and we moved to electromechanical regulation. So the Corrugated clear tubing and the blue and green parts that you see are just standard patient breathing circuit tubing uh, that's used with ventilators and anesthesia mach machines. 
And there's a large supply of that in hospitals. So our original idea was to use those types of parts uh, to keep the cost low. But actually in the end, we found a better solution. So let me show you that. Here's the final prototype. So you can see it has a nice um, graphical user interface with the touch screen and some LEDs for alarms. That white box is a breathing simulator that played a large role in our uh, approval process to make sure we could run all of the necessary tests to get approval at, in the FDA and in Health Canada. And then on the table over here, you see some of the earlier prototypes. So now let me show you the inside of the device. Here's what the final product looks like on the inside. So that circuit board, I've taken the, the top panel with the touch screen off. But if you ask nicely later, I happen to have one next to me, so I could show you that. But here's the inside of the, of the device. That circuit board is where the pressure sensors are and the valves and regulators are the black and silver things along the top. Uh, and so you can see it's all nice and compact, very um, professional looking. So this is the final product. It's produced by two manufacturers. One is Vexos in the US and Canada and the European manufacturer is uh, Elemaster. So now that you've seen the internals and the design of the device, I'm gonna pass the reins over to Tanaz to talk about its operating modes. Okay, thank you, Jen. <clears throat> so before um, I get started, um, I wanted to first echo the importance of working across disciplines to be able to achieve this um, work. Those of us at Fermidab who volunteered our time on this project, which included physicists and engineers, um, brought the skill sets that we acquire from particle physics research that we do at the lab every day. But the stakes were very high on this project, so we needed to build bridges across disciplines. Uh, we met and communicated with the medical community as well as our industry partners. Um, the biggest aspect of this cross-discipline uh, work was communication and finding a common language. Um, for example, as a personal experience, I took it on me to study respiratory physiology and mechanical ventilation books, which obviously does not make me an expert in medicine, but it did equip me with some basic understanding for a better communication. So this basic understanding is what I'm going to share with you in the next few slides. <clears throat> So Jen very nicely explained the lung mechanics of a person who can breathe on their own. I'm going to go over a simplified explanation of lung mechanics of a patient who finds it difficult to breathe or is unable to breathe on their own altogether and is therefore um, placed on a ventilator. So during mechanical ventilation, the ventilator pushes the air into the lungs, which generates positive pressure to deliver an adequate volume for effective oxygenation and removal of carbon dioxide, which is what ventilation is all about. Um, the lung mechanics of this process, therefore, is the study of lung function through measures of pressure, volume, and flow. And flow here is how fast the ventilator is pushing the volume of air into the lungs. There are a variety of other relevant measurements, two of them being resistance and compliance, which are the characteristics of the lungs themselves. And resistance is basically the thing that must be overcome during ventilation. This resistance can be present in the patient's breathing circuit or because the patient is intubated in the endotracheal tube, there's also resistance in patient's own airway and lungs. So generally some reasonable level of resistance is present. A higher than nominal resistance then is a clue to an underlying problem that needs to be addressed. Um, as a simple example, there could be secretions in the patient's airway blocking the flow of air, which need to be suctioned by a medical expert treating the patient. Uh, lung compliance, the other um, measurement that I wanted to mention, is the measure of expansibility of the lungs. So if the lungs are reasonably compliant, they would expand to an adequate volume with the pressure that the ventilator generates. Um, my favorite analogy for compliance is a balloon that you can easily inflate by blowing air into it by yourself. So high compliance is when your balloon is now changed to a old socks or plastic bag. 
uh, and low compliance, which indicates that the lungs are getting stiff, is when your balloon has changed into um, a car tire, let's say. So you can no longer blow air into it to inflate it by yourself. You need a proper air compressor. A lung pathology can increase or decrease the compliance. One example is actually acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, such as the type that affects COVID-19 patients, which decreases the lung compliance. Um, positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP can help with the inspiratory work of these ARDS patients, which takes me to the last bullet point. So PEEP is a setting in mechanical ventilation that ensures the pressure in the alveoli is always kept positive. Alveoli are these small air sacs which allow oxygen to move from lungs to the blood and the carbon dioxide to move out, a process typically referred to as gas exchange. So with PEEP, the idea is to keep the alveoli, alveoli open and breathing at all times. And the simplified equation at the bottom of the slide shows how all these measurements come together. Um, in a commercial ventilator, there are a variety of modes of operation as one can control any number of these measurements that I mentioned, with the exception of resistance and compliance, of course, since those are long characteristics. So in the case of MVM, there are two modes of operation and they both involve some form of pressure control and regulation. Okay, so let's go over the pressure control ventilation or PCV mode first. And you already remember this diagram from Jen. And here's how the MVM valves operate in this PCV mode. The expiration valve at the bottom shown in red um, closes while the other valve um, that controls the incoming airflow at the top, shown in green, opens to allow the medical air mixed with a fraction of oxygen to flow to the patient. Um, in PCV mode, the air that the ventilator flows into the lungs generates a preset positive pressure for a preset time. So you can set um, the respiratory rate, which is the number of breaths per minute. You can set the PEEP. You can set the ratio of inspiratory to expiratory time, which indicates how long the insp inspiratory phase should be compared with expiratory phase. So looking at the waveforms that we have in front of us, um, as the ventilator um, starts the inhalation cycle, we see that there is a high rate of volume <clears throat> that gets delivered to the lungs as shown in the flow versus um, time waveform at the bottom. During that time, the pressure increases until it reaches the maximum preset value, which is labeled as the PN on the pressure versus time waveform on the top. The ventilator then continues to keep the pressure constant over the inspiratory phase, and the inspiratory flow in, during that time goes down until it reaches zero at the end of the phase. So when the ventilator reaches the end of the inspiratory phase, the expiratory valve at the bottom, now shown in green, opens. And because there is positive pressure in the patient's lungs, the air flows out of the lungs and it vents out through the PEEP valve at the bottom. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the incoming airflow valve, um, now in red, closes in order to prevent any more flow of medical air to the patient. So here are the waveforms that show the expiratory pressure and flow patterns. Um, the air is now flowing out of the lungs, so the flow reverses in direction as shown at the bottom. And on the pressure waveform, that gets displayed as a drop in pressure as high rate of volume leaves the lungs. So as a reminder, because we want to keep a positive pressure in the alveoli at all times, the pressure does not <clears throat> go all the way down to zero, rather it reaches the set peak pressure as shown in the pressure um, waveform at the top. And the ventilator then continues to keep a constant peak pressure over the expiratory phase while the flow reaches zero at the end of the phase as shown in the flow waveform at the bottom. And the whole cycle basically just repeats itself. <clears throat> So the other operating mode of MVM is the pressure support mode or PSV. Um, this mode is for patients who are not strong enough to do the work of breathing, but are able to initiate a breath. On the pressure waveform, when patient initiates the breath, this is shown as a dip 
Um, and that's because as the patient initiates breath, the patient's diaphragm contracts slightly, which then slightly increases the volume in the lungs, which in turn reduces the pressure. The patient, however, is not strong enough to do the complete work of breathing. So when patient initiates the breath, the patient triggers the ventilator and the ventilator has to step in. In MVM, at that point, um, the expiratory valve shown in red closes and the incoming airflow valve um, shown in green opens um, to allow medical air to flow into patient's lungs. Uh, but note at this time, the inspiratory um, time finishes when the flow at the, shown at the bottom drops below a given fraction of the peak flow. Um, and at that point, MVM valves would change the state again. So the expiratory valve opens, um, now shown in green, and air flows out of the patient's lungs and vents out through the PEEP valve. At the bottom, it also closes, MBM also closes the incoming airflow valve in red, again, to prevent any flow of air to the patient. And we see the same reversal in flow on the flow versus waveform and the same reduction in pressure as on the pressure waveform down to the set PEEP uh, pressure. So the waveform that I showed earlier um, was to give you an idea of how pressure and flow waveforms change in PCV and PSV modes. Um, as to what the MVM waveforms look like, here's an example snapshot of pressure waveform on the top, volume waveform in the middle, and the flow waveform at the bottom. Um, and that's how things are shown for the PCV mode of the, on the touch screen display. Um, the waveforms change depending on the resistance and compliance of the lungs and due to many other reasons, of course. Um, in real life, these waveforms are not so cut or dry like the ones that I showed you um, in the previous slides. So the snapshot is just to give you an idea of what can be set and what can get reported in MVM. In the PCV mode, um, as shown here for the case. Uh, for, for the example that I'm showing. Um, so the medical experts in the PCV mode can set the respiratory rate, the maximum pressure, the inspiratory to expiratory ratio. Those are all the parameters at the bottom of the display. And the numbers on the right side are the measures, um, are the measured values that get reported. Um, there are also some smaller numbers in the same right-hand column, and those are just the minimum and maximum values below and above which the alarm will go off. Okay, so as I close the talk, um, I'd like to share this um, verse of poetry with you. It's um, from Sadi Shirazi, um, a 13th century poet. I was recently reading it and it just truly humbled me when I realized how well it resonates with just the current state of the world and with all these people coming together um, from various backgrounds and expertise to make a difference. So I'll just let the quote speak for itself and I'll close my talk. Thank you so much. And um, with that, if you have questions, um, please put them in the Q&A, uh, like I said, at the bottom. And also, uh, if you're watching with us on Facebook Live, um, you can put questions in the comments and I have someone sending those to me as well. Um, so the first question that came in um, from the audience uh, is for uh, Jim. The question is, what cardiac conditions are being considered for the treatment you shared towards the end? Oh, well, thank you for that question. The answer is ventricular tachyarrhythmias, specifically ventricular tachycardia and maybe ventricular um, fibrillation. Both of these are potentially fatal um, arrhythmias that need to be addressed through, um, uh, through the, the emergently through defibrillation. And there are three methods that are used for addressing this. One is with uh, medicine, but medicine often doesn't control this long-term. The other is to implant a defibrillator right into the patient's body. But if they were perfect, that would be great, but sometimes they can shock an individual inadvertently and, uh, um, and sometimes they fail when they are needed. So the third method is to get rid of the cardiac tissue that is abnormal and is creating the abnormal electrical signal 
that is producing the, the arrhythmia in the first place. The one way that is used to address this um, uh, method of getting rid of the abnormal tissue is called radio ablation. It just heats up the abnormal cardiac tissue and destroys it. But the procedure requires general anesthesia and takes five, six, maybe even longer hours and can have a high complication rate. The treatment that I'm talking about is done without general anesthesia. It's done relatively quickly. It's done one time. And thus far in the so-called Encore trial, it uh, seems to have some potential um, and is quite promising. Great. Uh, the, Jen, the next question is actually for you. Um, you said the designers originally intended to use conventional patient airway appliance tubing and other components and then found a better solution. What was it? So instead of that uh, corrugated plastic tubing, we designed a it's a metal block that we call the fluidics block and all of the pressure regulators and valves are mounted directly on that block. So it's just a machined piece of metal that allows the air to flow through and it's much more compact and also much more robust. And I'm gonna be the one that asks really nicely to show us the piece of equipment that you have behind you <laughs> because I'm curious. Sure. So here is the, well, now you get to see the <laughs> zoom. Uh, so here's the touch panel and <clears throat> you can see it has these LEDs for various priorities of alarm. And then the brains are attached directly, directly to the back of that seven inch touch screen. There's a um, ESP32 and a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and then the circuit board that you saw the picture of was a one of the only custom pieces, <clears throat> which is a circuit board that's pretty cheap to make, but that's the one that hosts all the pressure sensors. Um, but it doesn't do any of the actual supervising and regulation. Awesome. Um, that was cool. Thank you for showing that. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, Tanaz, I think this might be one for you. What is the mechanism by which pressure is maintained on expiration? So basically um, the core of the MVM, um, the software that uh, regulates the pressure um, is given a certain uh, set of parameters um, that would tell it uh, how long, for example, to keep the pressure at a certain level. And that's basically the, um, the, in, the inspiratory versus expiratory ratio, as well as the respiratory rate. And if you set those parameters on the software, it would basically determine which valves to close and open and at which point in order to keep the pressure in the lungs at um, a constant level before getting into the expiratory phase. Um, so the core of the NVM is able to do all of that and is basically the brain of the device. Awesome. And uh, Jim, you had said that carbon ion therapy makes you optimistic. Um, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. Um, like I said in the presentation, neutron beam radiation therapy that we had at Fermilab was very appealing because neutrons have a very powerful biological punch, but protons are the latest and greatest um, uh, particle therapy here today because they have such exquisite radiation dose distributions thanks to the Bragg curve, which has this Bragg peak with low radiation going in, a big peak, hopefully right where the tumor is, and then a sudden stop. Carbon ion radiation therapy also exhibits a Bragg curve with a Bragg peak, but that Bragg peak is augmented biologically. It uh, might have a physical dose of X, but the biological dose might be X times three. And in other words, it combines the best of the 
the proton world with the best of the neutron world. So um, there might be some wonderful opportunities for carbon ion radiation therapy in the future. It is being explored in full earnest in Japan and a few other countries. And uh, we're looking at ways of developing novel methods of delivering carbon ions to make it more affordable and more practical here in the United States. Thank you. Um, I did have a question for um, Jen and Tanaz. Uh, so, I mean, we know the motivations behind this, um, you know, the project for the ventilator. What, how did you even start? Like, how do you even bring this team of people together? How do you get your resources? If one of you wants to talk a little bit about that, like bringing this team in the situation that we're in together to build this and get it to production so quickly. So particle physics is a pretty small community. And one of our colleagues who is a professor at Princeton and also works on some experiments in Italy, he, he's an Italian uh, person also. He was in Lombardy, which was, if you recall back near the start of the, the pandemic was uh, one of the very high activity regions. His family, some of his family members are medical doctors. And so he was hearing firsthand reports of like how terrible things were and how uh, much there was gonna be a shortage of ventilators. And so he decided I have to do something. And so he first went to his collaboration, this experiment that he works on in Italy. And through that group, that experiment has a few hundred people on it. And he went and said, hey, I want to do this. Does anyone want to work with me? And a few people joined him. And then it, it kind of spread organically from there. So through a colleague that works on that experiment, reached out to some a bunch of people at Fermilab and said, hey, Cristiano is going to start this, has this idea. And since we have ex expertise in precise regulation of gas flow for other, for particle physics experiments, you know, maybe our expertise can come in handy. Anyone, let me know if you're interested. And I would, I saw the email and was like, yeah, I, I would like to do something. So I just said, what do you need? I'm happy to help. Yeah. You want to add something? Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. The experience has been quite similar. Um, and, you know, I, I was also to some extent hearing firsthand from some family members who are medical doctors um, in the US about how bad things were starting to get in the US hospitals. And I guess we all just wanted to help um, in any way that we could. And it's, it's been a rather interesting journey. Um, you know, we've been learning that there is just no boundary that would specifically define physics or uh, medicine or other sciences. And I guess every field of science to some extent um, is not only covering one side of the story in great detail, um, but in doing so, it also makes use of the stories covered by other fields of science. And I think it's not until you combine all these stories together that you can get a more clear big picture of um, what's going on around you and making a difference. And you know, as, as far as resources are concerned, um, um, you know, my, the personal approach that I had was reading um, some books, as many books as I could. And in fact, I, I have one of these uh, on my desk here, and it's, um, it's the Respiratory Physiology book by John West, which is a really great read, um, by the way. Um, but, you know, reading that, of course, doesn't provide the expertise done that someone with an MD degree has, um, or someone with a medical, extensive medical training has, but um, it did provide with some basics for better communication. And I guess it was overall very humbling experience because even though the base principles are physics, I learned to appreciate just the level of complexity and the intricate details um, you know, behind just human body and our, the functions of our lungs. Thank you. The next question is for um, 
Jim, um, are you familiar with ghost imaging? Photons are entangled before being beamed into a patient with significantly lower levels of radiation. Uh, can you conceive of a way in which this phenomena could be incorporated into beam therapy? Oh, you're muted. Well, good, because uh, I didn't have much to say as far as uh, um, how to creatively uh, integrate entanglement of any sort into modern radiation therapy. The concept is very interesting, but uh, thus far I haven't been able to figure out a way to um, entangle entanglement into my daily uh, routine. Thank you. Um, the next one is uh, asking about higher temperature superconductors. If we're looking for higher temperature superconductors, um, Jen or Tanaz, I don't know if either of you can take that question. I can. So I know that there are lots of ongoing studies to try to find high temperature superconductors. So for people who may not know, most superconductivity happens at very low temperatures, like liquid helium temperature. Uh, and so it costs a lot to build a system that circulates liquid helium to keep the, the wire cold enough to achieve superconductivity. Uh, so if you were to go to high temperature, what they mean by high temperature is something that is more like liquid nitrogen, which is I don't remember the number, what, what the boiling point is, but it's much warmer than liquid helium. It's also cheaper to get a lot of it. Um, so that's one thing. And then ultimately they would like to go to room temperature superconductivity. Um, so those are all areas that they're trying to push things to higher temperatures to make it more cost-effective to have superconducting magnets, for example. All right. Um, thank you so much for taking that question. Um, and uh, so I'm looking at the time and I do want to give everyone a chance to kind of um, close with sharing a little bit about their work. Um, Jen, I know you're here talking about the benefits of particle physics and the uh, ventilator project, but I just want to give you a chance to share um, something about your work that you're excited about, something that you're looking forward to, an experiment coming up and running, um, just so our audience gets a chance to hear about that. Sure, thanks. So usually I don't work on medical devices. This was a nice little interlude. <laughs> but normally I study neutrinos, which are a very interesting type of particle um, that change can change type as they're traveling. And the other interesting feature of them is that they don't interact with things very much at all. So you can shoot them like through the earth. You don't need to make a tunnel or anything. So the next big experiment that we're working on right now is something that Tanaz also works on. It's called the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. So we will create a beam of neutrinos at Fermilab and we will send it through the earth to come out in uh, South Dakota in a gold mine that's no longer being used to, well, all the my gold has been mined from it, I asked. And, uh, we're putting a neutrino experiment there. And so it's a really huge experiment with a liquid argon time projection chamber, which is a type of detector. Uh, and we'll shoot the neutrinos at it. And then we know what kind of neutrinos we started with. And then we'll look at the type of neutrinos that we see in South Dakota. And then we can understand better how the neutrinos fit into the rest of the universe. Uh, Cause they're kind of weird. Thank you. Uh, Jim, if you want to go next. Um, uh, the project that I'm continuing to do work on is the development of proton CT and proton radiography. The images that we've been obtaining with uh, these devices, which incidentally are, are um, the technology and the brains behind these efforts are from former Fermilab individuals. They're not from the physicians, that's for sure. The, um, the results thus far have been pretty encouraging. And the images are not better than what you would get with X-ray CT because that's quite good already, but it gives me much better information on the range of the clinical beam that I'm gonna use on the patient. And if I brag that protons stop and deliver no radiation after that stopping point, 
I better know where that stopping point truly is. So to improve the uncertainty surrounding the uh, um, range of a particle beam, proton CT and proton radiography, in my uh, estimation, are the, the best uh, way to go. There are other methods, um, ionoacoustics and dual energy CT, a lot of very interesting methodologies, but uh, um, I'm working with the proton CT and proton radiography project. That's keeping me busy. Thank you. Tanaz. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Jen mentioned um, the work on the neutrinos and the deep underground neutrino experiment. Um, and one thing that I can share um, is that currently, uh, to be a bit more specific about my work, we have a prototype detector, some kind of a test suit that uh, we are working on together with Jen and it's, um, it's a, some kind of a pressure vessel. You're feeling it with a certain um, gas. In our case, we're using argon um, and uh, we, we have a multi so-called um, a type of detector called a multi-wire proportional chamber inside of it and we're testing it um, to make sure that this types of um, detectors can find their way, their new home in the next generation detector get, that gets built for the deep underground neutrino experiment. So you, with these multi-wire chambers, you have a charged particle that passes through the chamber. It ionizes the atoms of the gas along the path. It releases ions, electrons, which can then get accelerated, keeping sort of the track of the particle and the image of it intact. And they can get accelerated by electric field towards a number of high tension wires and they get collected and we can read them out. Um, Sharpak, the person who invented these chambers has actually interestingly found many applications of these multi-wire chambers in med medical imaging I've learned. Um, so there was a paper from 2010, um, I, I think uh, Sharpak and a group of his colleagues, they develop a um, high speed gamma camera um, based on the same technology used in multi-wire chambers. And basically um, filled, it, filled that chamber with pressurized xenon gas. So in our case, we're using pressurized argon gas. Um, and they also operated the pressure, interestingly enough, very similar to when we were operating, we are operating it at, at, um, in our research uh, at Fermilab, uh, so five bar and 10 bar. So that was an interesting thing that um, I recently learned, but yeah, that's the type of exciting particle physics research we do at the lab here. Well, thank you all so much. This was so fascinating and I loved hearing about your work and thank you for taking questions and um, being with us on this Saturday evening. Um, for our audience, make sure you tune in at the same time tomorrow. It's the wrap up of our family open house with our iron scientists competition. So we have a, a scientist from NIU, Northern Illinois University, and we have a scientist from Fermilab competing um, in physics demonstrations to see who will be crowned the winner. And if you join us on Zoom, you get to vote and decide. So make sure you check that out. It's um, on our website and also you can find the link at Fermilab Ed on our Twitter page. So. Thank you again. Thank you all. This was great. Um, really enjoyed, really, really enjoyed this. So um, enjoy the rest of your evenings and um, thank you so much. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.